Good afternoon. Welcome to All About Animals. I am still Sherry Gratitor and I am still sitting with Garrett Fife from ABC Humane Rescue and Relocation. And we are continuing with the taping because there was so much to talk about that's happening in the woods today that we just couldn't get it into one segment. So we're going to keep talking about what's going on and put this on a second time. Garen had opened up the subject of turtles and we didn't get to finish it. So Garen, we're going to start with the turtles this time. Okay, when turtles are laying their eggs, they leave the water and they go out and they find a, a sunny place that the ground conditions are right for the eggs to hatch. And uh, they'll dig a hole, lay the eggs, and then the eggs will hatch out. And the mom's long gone, but they come out and they know which way to go to find the water and tur baby turtles go to the water. But when they're laying their eggs, they come out of the water and they're heading for their place and they're crossing a road and people see them crossing a road and they go and say, oh, a turtle in the road, I'll save its life. Where do turtles live? They live in water. I'll take the turtle and put it in the water. So, I mean, this all makes sense. It's, you know, very logical, but it's not right because the turtle is leaving the water to lay its eggs. These are females. They're full of eggs and they want to lay those eggs. They're motivated. So if you turn them loose in the water, they're going to turn back around. They're motivated to go and lay those eggs. And they're going they're, right back on the road. Right back on the road. So if it's crossing the road going that way, take the turtle, put it on that side of the road. If it's crossing the road going this way, whichever way its head is pointed, put it on that side of the road. That's very simple. Whichever way the head is pointed, put it there. Okay. It's called, why did the turtle cross the road? <laughs> right, to, to lay, lay eggs, eggs on the other side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you were talking about other kinds of turtles. What were you talking about, soft shells? Soft shells, yeah. Soft shells usually live in moving water. They like, to, they like streams. So uh, I was canoeing the Pecatonica with a friend of mine, a naturalist. And every time we came around the, a bend, it, it's very sandy. And there'd be these sandy hills facing south on these curvy bends. Nice and sunny and warm and sandy. Right. And so every, every time we, we came around the bend, there'd be 10 or 20 big female soft shells digging nests to lay their eggs on this, on this bank. And I mean, there, there, this river is so full of soft shells, it's unbelievable. So, uh, God. You'd come around. You'd come around and, and the, the turtles would go skidding down as fast as they could go and hit the water like surfboards and zoom into the water. And then when the babies hatch, you look all along the edge and there's all these little noses sticking up, all these baby soft shells all along these sand, sandy banks. I love it. And those, I'm sure, are prey to water birds? Oh, everything. Yeah, big fish? It, everything. Everything eats baby turtles. It's like rabbits. They're, they're, yeah. Uh, they're, oh, yeah. they're on the food chain. There. So, the turtles, you said most of them have laid their eggs, but there are still turtles that have yeah, not yet. Yeah, there's still some lay laying eggs. Yeah. There's still some, uh, some of the painted turtles are still laying eggs. Some of them already hatch babies. I found babies and I also saw some laying eggs. So it's a strange year because it's so cool. You had those warm days and, and some of the turtles laid their eggs then. And now you have warm days coming up again and they're starting all over again. And then we have the frogs. Ah. I mean, I have a swamp back of my house and I get spring peepers every year. Yeah. And I sit out here and I listen to them and they go, tweet, 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 the spring peepers do. Yeah. I had spring peepers two weeks ago. Mm, they yeah. thought it was spring because we did a cold snap. Right. And then it started to get warm again. Mm. And it just confused the heck out of these poor little guys. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm, see, I'm seeing crayfish now. And I'm seeing, gray tree frogs too yeah, now. And salamanders all over the place. Yeah. Um, but because the weather has been so <laughs> on again, off again, <laughs> up and down. Well, excuse me, I'm laughing, but there's some sort of an insect around and he's being a little scary. Um, but because, because the weather's been the way it is, it's really played havoc with lots of creatures. Yeah, it's strange weather. Strange weather. My plants are all blooming late. Yeah. They're all blooming late. Um, I have a hummingbird here who's very much dependent on my hostess when she comes and I don't have a flower in my hostess. Hmm. I will later, but they're very late this year. Um, has the, I know the weather is, and we can go, here's one we want to, I want to go to and touch on too, which is bees. Hmm. There was a tremendous die off of bees this winter. Absolutely. I, I lost four hives. 
you lost four hives. I have a friend who had four hives and lost all four. Yeah. And I had another friend who had eight and he's lost six. Um, and was that weather related or disease related or don't we know? Both. 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 The well, big problem is the Varroa mite. And the Varroa mite is a round looking, it looks like a flat little soccer ball. And imagine if you had a, a creature or two on you the size of a, of a 16 inch baseball feeding on your blood. That's, like, that's how it is to have for a bee to have a Varroa mite. Sure, because the bees are so small. And that weakens the bees and they go into the, uh, into the brood uh, where, where it's sealed over while well, the thing is developing, while well, the bee is developing and it's feeding on its juices in there. They actually go down in there waiting for the bee to develop. Wow. So, and they, they, they prefer the drone cells. So uh, what, what beekeepers do is they'll set up drone cells as kind of a lure for these varroa mites to come in and lay their eggs in the drone cells. And the drones get rid of the those males. cells? And then they take those cells and stick them in a freezer and freeze them kill the varroa mites, then put them back in the hive and the bees clean them out. And they'll lay more drones in there and the varroa mites will go in there. But you have to make sure you take the, the cells out while they're sealed, put them in the freezer, mm -hmm. kill the varroa mites and then put them back in. Otherwise you're breeding varroa mites if you let them go too far. So let's talk a little bit about the importance to be of bees to our environment. My God, one of every, what, one of every three or five bites of food that you take is produced by bees and it's billions and billions of dollars. If mankind became extinct today, the earth would begin to heal and would be a, a well-balanced natural paradise within uh, 100,000 years or so to be pretty much healed up. The rivers would be clean, you could drink out of them, any, all the animals could drink out of them anyway, and the air would be pure. Mm -hmm. If bees became extinct, it would be the greatest ecological catastrophe in the world. Thousands and thousands of species would become extinct. Because bees are our number one pollinator. Right. Well, they're, they're a very important pollinator. There are other pollinators. There are native bees, there are, there are flies, there are moths and butterflies. But and even the like native that. bees, I understand the populations are dropping. Yeah, they're all dropping. And we don't know why. No. We don't know well, why. I think it's pesticides and destruction of habitat. All, there's a whole bunch of, it's never just one thing. It's always a combination of factors. And man does so many things that, that, that uh, disturb the environment that it's hard to put your finger on a single cause because there seldom is a single cause. No. It's all kinds of stuff. And mm -hmm. it's, this one is really frightening. And I know that people who have never kept bees in the past are beginning to keep bees because of the concern of the population drop of bees right. and what will happen. And bees don't travel far. No. They stay fairly close to their hives. Um, and, they're, and they're not dangerous. People say, well, I'm allergic to bees, they're aggressive. And uh, they, they talk about bees getting on their food and coming and getting in their can of pop and all this kind of thing. Those aren't bees. Those are usually yellow jacket hornets. They're a kind of a wasp, a social wasp. They're very aggressive, but they eat other bugs. They're predators and the bald-faced hornets are predators. One nest will kill and eat 10,000 harmful insects a day. So even though they have a sting and they are dangerous, they're still useful. So if they're out away from you in places that aren't a problem, leave them alone. If you have an area of, of ground nesting bees where a bunch of little holes in the ground or in a log and the bees are flying in and out, leave them alone. Don't call an exterminator and have them spray the area. Don't, don't just disturb don't, it, don't Just don't go up. and jump on it. Yeah, leave it alone. And even if you go and jump on it, those kind of bees don't sting. If they have stingers and they're capable of stinging. If you grab and hold on to them, they can sting you and they will. But they're not aggressive. They're not protecting a, a colony like hornets and honeybees and things like that protecting a colony. They just, there's an individual hole and they don't really protect that. So they're not aggressive. You don't have to worry about being stung by them if there's a whole bunch of them around. Another thing, you see all kinds of bees on a tree, all kinds of hornets on a tree. And it's not just one kind, it's not just ball-faced hornets, not just polistes, not just yellow jackets. Paper wasps, the whole nine yards. Right, but it's a whole bunch of different kinds. 
and they're all over the trees, buzzing, making noise, they're, they're everywhere. People call and say, oh, my tree's infested with, with hornets. They call, everybody calls them bees. They don't know the difference between bees and hornets. So they call everything bees, and they're not bees, they're hornets. But, but what they're doing is they're preying on scale insects that are sucking the sap out of the tree. So all these predators are here eating the, the disease, the, the problem that's attacking your tree, and they're like medicine for your tree. They're doing good things, and you call an exterminator out to kill them because they're frightening to you and you don't understand it. Try to understand what's happening. Try to find out. Uh, don't just say, well, that's a problem. I'm going to call an exterminator. Call a, a naturalist. Call a museum and say, here's what's happening. Explain it to me. And, and there, when people are starting off in, in the world, they don't know everything. And I talk to naturalists and entomologists, and uh, they specialize in certain things, but they don't know everything. And, and a lot of times they don't understand what's happening. But once you explain it to them, they do understand because they're scientifically minded, they're nature oriented, they're nature uh, lovers, and they want to understand these things and they want to share it with you. So if you call these people and ask them these questions, they are very willing to share their knowledge with you. And then once you understand it, you feel empowered to do something good instead of just doing something. And when you do something good for nature, you've done something good for the whole world for your grandchildren, for all the, the bees and butterflies and birds and, you know, you're, you're part of the, the healing of the planet. And that's a good feeling. So get that feeling, learn things, be part of it, love nature. One of the things that we've been doing this year in my property is we've planted a whole bunch of swamp milkweed. Cool. Swamp milkweed is the food of choice of the monarch butterfly. Asclepias incarnata and Asclepias uh, tuberosa and as, what is the other, uh, the common milkweed. Oh God. It's common milkweed. Yeah, the common milkweed. Common anyway, milkweed. the common milkweed. Syriaca, Asclepias syriaca. We've had a terrible drop in our, in our monarch, monarch butterfly population mm -hmm. and they're beautiful creatures. Monsanto is killing off our milkweeds. Yes. And people here are killing them off. They say, oh, they've got this milk and I get a rash if I get it on me and it makes fuzzies and they make me sneeze. The most beautiful common milkweed smells as good or better than the finest rose. You remember when, when you first smelled a rose, how amazing it was, how it filled you up? Well, common milkweed it has a big round flower made up of a whole bunch of flowers. It looks like a round ball of flowers. When that's fully in bloom, go up and put your nose down there and take a whiff of that and it's intoxicating. It's one of the most beautiful fl flowers to smell in the entire world. It's just a common milkweed. So they say stop and smell the roses, stop and smell the milkweeds. And let the, let the monarch butterflies eat. Absolutely. And plant things that the butterflies will come to. Plant things that make seeds for the birds. Yeah. Uh, plant things that the deer won't decimate. And they're out there. I've got a whole garden of, of, of wonderful flowers that the, be, the deer do not bother. Yeah. Uh, from, from lamb's ear to uh, irises to a whole bunch of stuff. Whole mm -hmm. bunch of stuff that they won't bother. So basically, Garen, what we're saying is that we all have a responsibility to make the world a better place and make it a better mm -hmm. place for the creatures that live in it. That's our job. That's our destiny as human beings. Yeah, we hope. It is. And we hope it it's truly everybody's is. destiny. Well, we haven't, not, humanity hasn't quite realized what their destiny is yet. But that is our destiny, is to take care of the planet, to be good shepherds, good husbands, good gardeners for this planet. So wake up and smell the milkweed and take care of the world. <laughs> and I'm going to take you now to save a pet and show you some of the dogs and cats that are available there One for One of my adoption. favorite people here. <laughs>